Hi, and welcome to our 11.30 press conference, First Images of Thunder. Our participants are Maher Daya, research scientist at this, in the Space Science and Engineering Division at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. And on the phone, we have Joseph Dwyer, professor, and Peter T. Paul Chair at the Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space at the University of New Hampshire in Durham, New Hampshire and Douglas Jordan, Director of Operations at the International Center for Lightning Research and Testing in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, so we all know how a lightning strike look like, and we all hear the thunder that comes out from this lightning strike. Today, what we're going to present to you is the first image of the thunder that comes out from a lightning strike. Uh, basically, you will see what we hear. Uh, this work is, is in collaboration between Southwest Research Institute and the different institutions. These are the University of Florida, University of New Hampshire, and the Florida Institute of Technology. We have with us on the phone Professor Joe Dwyer from University of New Hampshire and Professor Doug Jordan from the University of Florida. They will be answering questions related to the microphysics of lightning initiation and how we artificially triggered lightning itself. So uh, we'll start, I will just give you a general background on what we know about thunder and what we do not know. The general perspective, we understand the general mechanics of how thunder occurs. So every time we have a lightning strike, you basically heat air to very high temperatures during very short time periods, and then you create a shock wave. So this shock wave propagates and then we hear it. If you are close to a lightning strike, you would hear a loud boom. If you are away from a lightning strike, you would hear rumbles and so forth. This is what we know, that thunder is created by a lightning strike. What we do not know is what are the, the processes of lightning that contribute to the thunder that we hear. So if you are close to the lightning strike, I just said that you hear a loud boom. In fact, you hear cracking sounds sometimes. Sometimes you hear uh, loud boom only if you are too close. So all these sounds that are overlapping to create this sound that we perceive, we still do not know. What are the physical processes that contribute to this one? To be more particular, I will show you these three images over here. These are basically energetic processes associated with the lightning strike. The first uh, panels here, uh, uh, this one is called step leaders, basically right before the lightning strike takes place, we have these leaders uh, propagating down. And then uh, when they come close to the ground, we have uh, positive streamers. Of course, this is only the case of cloud to ground lightning. We have different cases, but that's out of, out of the scope now. We have these positive streamers that launch from the ground top to meet these propagating down step leaders. We do not know if these two things create an acoustic signature or not. When lightning happens, you can see here on this panel a lightning flash with, with lots of branches. We do not know if these branches create an acoustic signature or not. Some of them do, some of them do not. All what we know is we hear this uh, sound wave coming to us, which is probably the overlapping of, of all the sound that's created very close to the lightning channel itself. So these fancy images of lightning would not have happened 20 years ago because we did not have these fast cameras to technologically capture these. So in order to image lightning, you need a fast, sophisticated camera. In order to image thunder, which is the acoustic signature of lightning, you would need a sophisticated ear, basically, a giant ear, something like that. So you need a special ear to hear where thunder is coming from across the lightning channel. Maybe something like this. This is, a, this is actually a real picture. This is an acoustic amplifier used between World War I and World War II to detect airplanes. We did not have radars at the time, so they used this kind of things. This amplifier provides directionality and amplification. So you basically have a giant ear that you can steer wherever you want to hear if there's a sound source or not. If we do something like this with the lightning channel, can we isolate where the sound is coming from? Of course, with, adma with the advancement of technology, we can minimize this huge ear and just use a technique in signal processing 
where we can, uh, where it basically enables us to have uh, directionality and amplification of the acoustic signal. And this is called beamforming. Beamforming, uh, I will not go into the details of it, but it's a widely based technique. For instance, the, uh, the ultrasound images uh, that uh, for small babies and so forth, not, uh, basically, basically for pregnant ladies, the ultrasound images are taken uh, using a technique called beamforming technique. This is one established technique. So to explain this in two slides, I'll try to make it very simple. That imagine, uh, here I have three different microphones, and then a sound source pops at the, that corner of the room. Sound is slow. It moves 340 or so meters per second. So the sound wave from that source would arrive at the first microphone, and then after a little, a little bit of time, it would arrive at the second microphone, and then after a, li a little bit of time, it will hit the third microphone. So my signals would look like this. This is the first microphone, this is the second microphone, the third microphone. Well, I'm holding the microphones, and I know where the source is. So I know the distance, and I know the speed of sound. So if I move my signals back and forth, basically account to correct for the speed of sound, I can make, uh, so basically I can take out the delay that I have, and I, and I can just put the signals right below each other, and now I can add them up. Adding them up would provide one thing, amplification of the signal in a specific direction, because if the sound is over there, then I can calculate the distances between the sound and the microphone, and then steer wherever I want. So this gives me this giant ear that provides directionality and amplification that I was talking about. Good, so we have the giant ear, we need a lightning strike now. Lightning is unpredictable, it's wild. It doesn't make sense to just hold your instrument and go wait for a lightning strike to hit. So to do this, we use a very established and successful technique called triggered lightning. Triggered lightning, basically, instead of uh, waiting for a lightning strike, you bring lightning strikes to you uh, during thunderstorm conditions. We do this at the International Center of Lightning Research and Testing uh, in Stark, Florida. This is operated by the University of Florida and the Florida Institute of Technology. And they do experiments to create nice, beautiful images like this. These are long exposure Im images of the lightning strike. The technique, uh, basically, you watch uh, when you have thunderstorm conditions of enhanced electric field, you shoot a rocket into the clouds. The rocket trails a copper wire behind. So it's basically bringing the ground up, enhancing the electric field really fast, and then you're bringing the charges down from the cloud. The green color is uh, the explosion of the copper wire that's trailed. And then you see the return strokes. So the purplish ones are actually the uh, lightning part of the process here. Good, so now we have lightning and we have the giant ear I was talking about. So now we can do the experiment. We can image thunder. <coughs> Let's see if it works. So as I explained, we have an array of microphones. So we got f uh, 15 sophisticated microphones. We put them in a linear array, one meter apart. Uh, of course, if you put them in one dimension or two dimension, you would have uh, different things to observe and so forth. But in our case, we know where the lightning strike is. We, array, we align them as a linear array. Uh, the picture over here, uh, uh, this is basically an aerial picture from top. This is the triggered lightning launch pad. This is where the lightning strike would hit. The distance to the, our array is 95 meters, and this is the 14 meter array that we're using. In this panel over here, uh, this is a, a picture of of our array, we have basically uh, the microphones raised on tripods and uh, uh, connected to a 14 meter aluminum beam structure. Uh, this uh, box is the control box. Uh, it contains all our, all our electronics because of course during thunderstorm we want to protect your equipment. This is a box that protects us from all nature's elements and so forth. And this is the launch pad over here. So we are good to go. On July 14, 2014, we were in thunderstorm conditions and we triggered this event. So first I will run the movie and then I will comment a little bit.
Okay, so this event had nine return strokes. What we do, I repeat it. First, we launch the rocket into the sky, and then you can see the vaporization of the wire itself. It's called the wire burn stage, where it just explodes, and then you can see the consequent return strokes. I'll do it again. Cool. So, uh, our array is here, right facing the uh, lightning strike where it hits. So, results. Now, what you see here is basically the recorded signal from one of the microphones. Uh, this panel here shows a long time exposure of the event itself. You can see the wire vaporization and the nine subsequent return strokes. This one, the blue curve, is the time series. So it's just basically whenever uh, you have a loud sound arriving, you would see this peak. Uh, you, uh, and the background, the uh, colored panel, is called the spectrogram. Uh, this is the frequency domain of what's recorded on the microphones. So it, you can see time on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the frequency. What are the frequency components associated with this event? You can actually clearly see the rocket launch into the sky here. And you can see the wire burn, as indicated, and then the subsequent return strokes of the event. So now we want to use 14 of these curves to provide the image of thunder, as I explained. So with the microphones, we created this large ear, the giant ear that we can steer up and down. So we combine all the data with some algorithm and mathematical processing, and we got something like this. This is the very first image that we got for this event. Uh, of course, it looks uh, nice and everything. The first thing I did with this one is, at that time, actually, my wife and I were uh, looking to get a painting to put on top of the fireplace at our home. And then I take this one, and then I tell her, look, this is really a nice piece of modern art. And then she goes, wow, this is really nice. Until I told her, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. So she said, you know what? Maybe it's not a good idea to put this <laughs> in front of us. The whole day. OK, so basically here, the horizontal axis is time as well. And the vertical axis is the elevation. So the elevation means, the, or, the, or the altitude along the vertical channel. So I have the giant ear. And then, uh, for, uh, so uh, here, I'm looking at the base where the lightning hits. And then as I steer upward, you start going up into the sky. But this really does not have much information. The only information you get from this one is where uh, uh, basically uh, the shock wave, the acoustic shock wave, arrived at this time. And then we thought, so this one with all the frequencies. This contains all the frequency content. So we thought, let's look at different bands of frequency. Let's see if it makes a difference. So this one is the same image, but only we pick the data where the frequency is less than 100 hertz. And now we start going up in frequency. This is between 100 and 500, 500 and 1,000, and then this is more than 1 kilohertz. You can see that as we go higher in frequency, things become look nicer, and then you start seeing structures in the data. Well, this curve that you see here, this is the signature that's coming from the vertical profile of the lightning channel. This is the image of thunder. This is the acoustic signature of a single return stroke. Now, why it's curved like this? Sound is slow, so the sound would come from the base of the lightning channel. It would arrive first at your microphones, and then as, as you start getting up higher and higher in the channel, your sound is crossing more distance, basically, and then it would arrive later in time on the microphones. So later in time means you observe this curve over here. Well, great. So this event had nine return strokes. Let's see if we, ob if we observe all of them. And this is what you see. The left panel shows the long exposure time of the lightning event. The right panel shows the individual acoustic signatures of the return strokes. If you, if you look at the very first one, the first return stroke, I will go back because we magnify it here. You can see there's also another signature here. This is not a return stroke, but this is associated with a a current pulse called an M component. So this is basically a continuing current that occurs after the return stroke. 
Sometimes they create acoustic signatures, sometimes they do not. So now, let me just go back. Uh, so these are the acoustic signatures uh, as they come from the vertical profile of the channel. So if I assume a distance from the array to the lightning channel, and then I know this speed of sound, and then I account for the propagation effects coming from all along the lightning channel, I can basically create the acoustic profile of thunder very close to the lightning channel itself. So I know the propagation time. I take the signal that I measure and go back close to the vicinity of the channel. I account, of course, for the propagation loss effects and so forth. And then we get something like this. What you see here, the upper panel is a long exposure of, a, of two different events, uh, of two different lightning strikes. The lower panels are the acoustic signatures of them. This is the image of thunder associated with these two events. This is the first of its kind. Now, the most important thing about this one is it enables not only inferring the shape of the lightning strike itself, but the radiated acoustic power along the vertical profile of the channel. This is very important. Now, this one, we just used a linear array. This was just a proof of concept. A much more sophisticated array would give us much more details as well. So you can see over here, for instance, that the loudest sound, uh, the loudest sound in this case uh, is coming from the lowest part of the channel. Now, I want to emphasize here that we are only looking at really the lower part of the channel because these were the configurations that our array allowed us to do, uh, the lowest 100 meters or so. And then the loudest is coming where the strike is at attaching into the ground. You will, we're hearing this loud boom, and then you can see that's why the, it's much more intense over here. So conclusions, uh, we showed that uh, uh, acoustic imaging from lightning is possible and would enable us to understand much more about the processes that generate thunder and why do we hear it and perceive it this way. We presented the first image of thunder that shows the uh, lightning channel profile as well as the radiated acoustic power that's associated with it. And then uh, every time you basically develop a new technique or you discover a new tool to do anything, you open the door on many other experiments. So now we show that this is a proof of concept more sophisticated techniques would enable us to target specific questions. For instance, uh, the branching of lightning, uh, upward and downward propagating streamers and step leaders and so forth. Uh, we can infer the energetics associated with different parts of the channel. So uh, one example would be a uh, lightning channel is very zigzaggy like of thing. So do these zigzags emit the same acoustic power? We do not know. We can infer that. Uh, the attachment point of lightning, how much power is emitted, acoustic power is emitted from there, we can also infer that. Uh, we can do basically lots of things using this technique. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from reporters in the room? Uh, my name is Jean-François Clich. I'm a reporter for newspaper Le Soleil in Quebec City. Um, do you have a hypothesis as to why uh, the loudest part is close to the ground? Sorry? Do you have a hypothesis? Yeah, of course. Okay, so the question is why the loudest, why the loudest uh, part is coming from the ground in this case? Well, uh, uh, first of all, this is triggered lightning. So the lower part of it is really straight. It's not much zigzaggy. Number two is we're looking at the lowest 80 meters in this case or so. So we're, we're looking really at the part where, where the channel is attaching into the ground. And this is basically where you, you hear this loud explosion. And this is probably why you, we are seeing that the loudest sound is coming from this region. As you start going up, uh, the intensity of sound starts going less and less. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Are there any questions on the chat? We'll give it a second. There's a small delay. Sure.
Oh, and also just to note that the photos, um, there is a link in the virtual press room on the Media Center to the photos that are um, at the Southwest Research Institute on their website. There's a link there. Or you can email us at news at agu.org. Or if you're in the room, I believe that, uh, that there are some uh, yeah, so flash drives some available uh, with the photos. Flash drives which, un which contain yeah. uh, the high resolution stuff, the v video clip, and two images that I will be distributing. So. Are there any questions in the chat? Okay, so we have a question from Alex Witsey, who is with Nature. Um, what follow-up will you be doing this summer? Okay, for this summer, uh, we are probably late to do an experiment from scratch, but uh, we will definitely be, pro be basically uh, looking ahead to investigate more details, uh, more details of thunder generation, in particular, we would like to target the branching. We want to see if the branches of lightning emit an acoustic signal. We would like to infer the uh, acoustic energy that's emitted along the vertical profile of the lightning channel. When, would, when this would happen, we're not, no, we're, we are not sure yet. I have another question from Alex. Um, can you put this into context with any other acoustic studies of lightning that have been done in the past? Sure. So. Over the last 20, 30 years, uh, most uh, of uh, the audible part of thunder was emphasizing on something called ranging. Ranging, basically, you reconstruct the lightning channel profile using uh, three or more microphones. You spread them around the lightning channel. But these microphones cannot be close to the lightning channel. They should be far apart, kilometers in this case. So using this one, you can construct where the sound is coming from, basically at using triangulation and correlation analysis, and you can have a profile of the lighting channel. However, this would not, first of all, resolve the individual return strokes in a lightning event. And most importantly, it cannot infer the acoustic radiated power along the vertical profile of the channel, which is extremely important in this case. Uh, of course, it will also not yield any information about uh, how big the event is, is there branching, is there uh, how many return strokes, anything cannot be inferred. Ranging can only just be used basically to pinpoint uh, that, uh, to pinpoint a loud uh, source of sound, basically, in this case. Are there any additional questions? Any questions in the room? Okay, I believe that uh, concludes our press conference. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Our next press conference will be at 1 o'clock on Ontario water contamination. Thank you.